So I'm actually one quarter Indian. Uh, uh, my grandfather on my mom's side is from uh, outside of uh, Madras or Chennai in the state of uh, Tamil Nadu. And uh, so that's why I'm a little bit darker. And that's why um, in middle school I was called a beaner once. So it's, uh, you know, I, I remember being a little bit shocked, but not really, it wasn't quite like being offended, but it was like, oh, so you're going to be a racist, but you can't even be a good racist. <laughs> <laughs> you're kidding. So it was, it was just utterly confusing for me. Um, so uh, Vietnamese Americans in Multnomah County, this is a, uh, from research from the Coalition of Communities of Color, uh, Vietnamese Americans in Multnomah County make an, on average $13,500 less than their Vietnamese peers in the rest of the country. And then versus if you're white and you're in Multnomah County, you usually make $3,500 more than your uh, white peers in the rest of the country. So there's, there's you know, a few things going wrong here. And you know, first step is awareness, and it's great to have these talks. We are really kind of cosmopolitan people. As much as America needs for us to be miserable and minuscule minorities. And this is true from my African cousin over here, Kofi Desu. We have a long, elegant history which we bring here. Ask us. In fact, we intend now to lead. We intend now not to follow anymore. We have seen what happens when ethnic minorities in America follow the mainstream. We're not so happy about it. So without asking now, we're going to begin leading. It's not an insurgency, take a deep breath. <laughs> no jihadis in the room. <laughs> and most of them I can say that. <laughs> but for us to follow is no longer workable. It's not happy, it's not healthy. Not for us certainly, not for mainstream America. Why did we uh, leave Vietnam? Because that was, um, we are refugees. <coughs> if um, we stay there, there's no freedom. Think that we take them for granted here. And also most people come here because they want to sacrifice their life for the better um, life for the next generation. I think that one of the things that I think refugees that contribute to this country is to make it better for the next generation. So, when we got here, several parents usually work two, three jobs. You know, we, when we were in Vietnam, watching at that time black and white TV, we think that um, America is the utopian. Right? We come here disappointed, but we said we had to make the most out of that. Work two, three jobs, go to school, go to college, learn English. Despite of all of the barriers that we had to face, the language, the culture, or the racism, we sacrificed for the better um, generation. And most of us make it. A lot of us didn't make it. Most of us make it. And one of the things that Paul was talking about, that how I have been in the um, um, working on the social justice issue for the last 30 years or so, the first day that I come here, because I see that. I've seen that parents put a lot of hope and dream in their children in the next generation. So education is really important. They make um, students, I was a little bit older then, but younger than kids. We would go to school, and then we go back, and then we study, we do doing homework in the summer, the whole summer, like if I'm the eighth grade in the summer, I will start for the ninth grade next year. So next year when I come to school, the teacher actually didn't teach me anything because I didn't learn all of that. And I come back and then they would hire a private tutor um, to teach me for the next grade level. So actually the educational system in the U.S. didn't do anything for the Asian kids actually. Uh, and most of the kids who can't afford that didn't make it. So I see a lot of hope and dream being destroyed. And, and I see that for other uh, uh, kids from other race and ethnic group also. 
You know, you guys have heard about the pilot from school to prison. I have been in the juvenile justice system for uh, the last 20 some years. I see that happen. I see dream and hope destroyed. That's why I'm working on this uh, very issue. I have four children raised here, uh, born Americans and loving Americans. Uh, so, and then I do have my elderly parents who live with us who are completely old generation conservative Indians uh, who wear the Indian garbs and only talk Indian and only eat Indian food. Uh, so I do feel like I'm in a middle age and get pulled both ways. It has been a very huge adjustment on uh, being an Indian, but then being pulled by my parents as traditional, and then pulled from my children as uh, being Americans. And you know, they want to go dating, and my mom says, "Oh no, no dating <laughs> has to be an arranged marriage." You know, so um, it's it's been an interesting experience. We love Portland. Uh, though when we first came to Portland, I know that we would call for apartments to rent an apartment and they would say, yes, we have a free, you know, we have apartments. And when, they, when we would go to visit it, they would see us and say, we don't have. So that's what Oregon was 30 years ago. And now to see how wonderfully changed it is, uh, it's very heartening. Uh, however, all those experiences kind of defined uh, how we raised our children. <coughs> We pass on those experiences to our kids. And when the kids would get excited that, oh, my friend said this, we would always caution them that, remember, you are not from this country. You know, Maybe they are saying this to you, but maybe it's not true. So we did tell that to our kids. And thankfully, they didn't believe us, because those were not their uh, experiences. Uh, but we did pass this on to our children. Usually, uh, people from India are uh, professionals. They have come here for professional jobs, um, engineers or doctors. Um, we tend to force our children to go into those fields also, though they have started fighting us back, and which is great. Um, I don't have any doctors nor one engineer out of my four children. <laughs> um, 